I am Bill Anderson. I represent the College of Arts, Science, and Education. I have a, a silly title called the Vice Dean. And uh, it's an honor to be here to rep be, rep be uh, introducing our keynote speaker this afternoon, Professor Howard Gardner. His talk is Higher Education and Internet. Good afternoon. Good to see you all. And I think I'll start. <laughs> Um, it says here I have to apologize uh, both to Bill Anderson and the rest of you because uh, this difference between when you're asked to give a title and when it finally comes to putting together a talk. And uh, for lots of reasons I decided to switch the focus of my talk to some, first, to some extent. Um, and I hope you'll forgive me. One of the things I do want to say at the outset is that uh, we were at a conference on thinking, and as most of you know, these conferences have been going on for quite a while. But I have to say, if we look at the world, I don't think thinking has gotten much better in the last 30 or 40 years. Um, there's a lot more work to be done if we think about the, the quality of discourse and decisions that are being made both locally and nationally and internationally. So the work continues, and I'm hoping that the, the talk I'm going to give today will be a push in the right direction. So as the slide says, I've moved to a consideration of higher education in the United States. Um, how many of you were not educated in the United States? Wow. Okay. Well, uh, for the first 90% of the talk, uh, no, I'm going to stretch toward the end, but I actually believe that the contents will be um, relevant whether or not you went to a two or four year school in the United States. Um, and as you can see from the, the slide, um, I will talk at the end about um, international aspects of this, this presentation. So as Bill Anderson said, if you know me, you probably know me as the multiple intelligences guy. What you may not know is that I developed those ideas 40 years ago. And uh, I could keep singing the MI tune, but I'm kind of tired of it, and probably many of you are tired of it as well. And my work in intelligences began in psychology, but I really moved toward education for lots of different reasons. And so initially as a developmental psychologist, I asked the question, well, what are, the th what are the ways of thinking that we bring into the world before we encounter formal education? In what ways does formal education either build upon or clash with some of those more natural, more evolutionarily bound ways of thinking? And from the unschooled mind, I moved to an investigation of the disciplined mind. And actually, I think this is a, an idea which has gotten more remote nowadays when we talk about um, learning online or entrepreneurship or interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary thinking. These are all legitimate aspirations, but if people don't have discipline, both the sense of learning to think in the ways that outstanding thinkers have thought in the past, and also working steadily on stuff and getting better at it, uh, to put it this way, sacrificing discipline and disciplines is a very big sacrifice. Um, Recently, which means the last six or seven years, I've switched my attention fundamentally from psychology to education and from K-12, which most of you are probably involved in, to higher education. How many of you are actually spending time in a college or university rather than K-12? Okay, so about 17%. Uh, um, I had a machine that told me that. Um, um, how many of you have higher education? Okay. So I'm hoping that uh, you connect one way or the other to 
this study. So um, one of the reasons that I became interested in higher education is a study we did of young people, roughly 15 to 30, and we found that these young people often wanted to do good things, that's why we talked about making good, but they were very keen on being successful and being powerful and making lots of money. So they said, well, someday, when I'm a big, powerful person, I'll be a good person. But in the meantime, I'm going to put that on hold, especially since all the people around me are kind of uh, fiercely ambitious, have sharp elbows, and uh, I don't want to lose to those people. So being good is an aspiration for when I become king or queen of the hill. This was rather upsetting. Uh, and this made me begin to work about a dozen years ago with uh, college students to see whether I could get them to think about what it means to be a good person, a good worker, a good citizen, before they're 50 or 60 years of age, when in a sense, uh, most of you are younger, it's too late. Um, now, if you, how many of you know about the Chronicle of Higher Education? Have you heard of it? If you read the Chronicle of Higher Education, Every week they advertise or they publicize at least a half a dozen new books on higher education. So you might legitimately say, does anybody have anything new to say on the topic? And I read a lot of those books. And with my colleagues, who I will thank later, I said, you know, there's a lot more attitude in these books than there are, than there are data. Many, many people think they know what's wrong with higher education and how to fix it than actually have a lot of data. And so with my colleagues, I decided we're going to really try to find out how people all over the country who are involved with higher education think about it. So that was, um, that was a motivation for the study. Also, if you read uh, the domestic press in America, and I can't see this slide, um, and you may not be able to see it either, but I'll tell you what it says. What it basically says is that a majority of people in this, in this country, the United States, who are conservative, actually think higher education is bad for the country. More than a majority think of that. And um, that's pretty upsetting, because I know that if you had done this study 15, 20 years ago, you would not have found that to be the case. Now, most of the institutions and organizations in the United States are less well thought of now than they were 15 or 20 years ago. So in a sense, higher education is simply a victim of that general, um, shall we say, uh, just ha unhappiness. But you didn't have that before with respect to higher education. So those of us involved with higher education, or those of us who care about higher education, and here we are at FIU, should be very concerned if um, large parts of our population think that higher education is bad. Not just useless, but bad for the country. Also, and Bill Anderson mentioned this in his title, most of the schools that we know of think of themselves as liberal arts school. The word liberal arts is thought of so badly in this country that the best thing we could do is get rid of it entirely. And there's even data on this. If you give a set of subjects a description of a curriculum, and you either include the word liberal arts or not, the description is exactly the same. What do you think is found? Who knows? Raise your hand if you know. Raise your hand if you think you know. Raise your hand if you don't think you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, all right. We, we give you a curriculum. This subject, these number of credits, these advisors, and in one condition, we say this is a liberal arts curriculum. In the other one, we just say it's a college curriculum. Well, you figured out the answer. The very use of the word liberal arts radically reduces whether people think what they think of the curriculum, even if the curriculum is identical. So obviously, it's the word liberal or the word arts or the combination which is dead on arrival. If you understand what I just said, please raise your hand. Thank you. <laughs> If you don't understand, see me later, no photographs. Uh, I can't read this slide, but it basically says the same thing, so let's just move on. It has to do with uh, 
the uh, antipathy that people have to anything that says liberal arts. So when we think about campuses, this is what we think of, right? We think of libraries, we think of museums, we think of faculty, <laughs> and so on. Um, but to the extent that people are condemnatory of higher education and condemnatory of liberal arts, what we get is closing the library, closing the museum, closing the labs, and getting rid of the faculty. Pretty dramatic. And yet, if you think higher education is bad for the country, why would you want to have faculty, museums, libraries, um, or ca uh, campus? So have I, have I raised your temperature? Good. Um, so we started a study in 2012, so six years ago, called Liberal Arts and Sciences in the 21st Century. We thought it was an innocent title, but we've gotten rid of the title because we don't want to have half the country <laughs> dismissing what we say before we even get to the results. Um, so now I haven't decided what to call it yet because we're still collecting data after six years, but we'll call it higher education or deeper education or non-vocational education, something that makes people not reach for their gun right away, and it is a national study. So here's the design of the study. Um, as I say, we're completing year five, moving to year six. It's a seven-year study. We're studying 10 campuses which deliberately very different from one another. Um, let me tell you, I'm, I'm gonna be a little bit uh, classificatory here because you may not know these schools. The, the most selective schools are Duke University, Tufts University, and Kenyon College. That means they reject more students than they admit. Um, then, University of New Hampshire is a typical state school. Um, DePaul is the largest Catholic school in the United States, in Chicago. Um, there's a whole bunch of alphabets. You probably have all have heard of OSU, Ohio State University. And some of you will have heard of Queens College in New York, part of the City University of New York. But you probably won't, don't know what CSUN is, unless you're from California. California State University of Northridge, and I believe it's bigger than FIU. And BMCC, Borough of Manhattan Community College. Uh, so these are very different schools. So BMCC is two years. Um, DePaul is Catholic. Olin, who's heard of Olin College? One of my favorite schools. It's a control school. It's actually an engineering school. It's the only vocational school we're using. But one of the most wonderful things anybody in the study has said is a college student at Olin who said, I'm getting the best of both worlds, a liberal arts education and an engineering degree. A liberal arts education and an engineering degree. Don't forget that because it may be the future. Olin is very unusual, and if we had time, we could talk about why it's unusual, but we included it because whenever you do a study of one category of enter entities, it's useful to have a comparison one, and Olin was a comparison one for us. So, in addition to having an amazingly wide range of schools, we also are interviewing eight constituencies, 200 per campus, that's how we get to 2,000, 50 freshmen, first-year students, 50 seniors, that was graduating, or in the case of the borough of Manhattan, um, people are going on to four-year schools or going into the workforce, and a small number of faculty, senior administrators, alumni, parents, trustees, and job recruiters. And uh, we're, we've passed the 1900 mark, and I've actually read every single one of the interviews and I've probably done a three or 400 myself. So my mind is filled with what people in this country are thinking about higher education today. And by the way, we, we don't use the word liberal arts till the very end when we say, what does the term liberal arts mean to you? And not surprisingly, we could write a book 
just on that topic. And even though it's very hard for me as a researcher to say this, we didn't begin with any particular hypotheses. It was really a data collecting, information gathering interview. Um, but we were interested in the extent to which these different constituencies on different kinds of campuses thought similarly or thought different from one another. And I can say I've been more surprised by the similarities than the differences, even though some of these schools are highly selective, some of them are not, some of them are very big, some are not, some are urban, others are not, one is religious, one is, uh, is vocational, but I would say that I'm more struck by the similarities in how Americans, though some of the schools have, are loaded with non-US citizens, including DACA um, young people, or not so young people, how similar they think about things. So that's a surprise. So, by agreement, we don't discuss publicly what we found at any particular school. I think that's only fair. Um, but to each school, we will go back and tell them exactly what we found, if they want to know it. And when you hear some of the things they may not want to know. Um, but we can group them in terms of selectivity. SAT is a college entrance exam. Size and other dimensions um, listed here as well. So we can group them and we can give results that way, but we're not going to say Tufts is better or worse than Kenyon on a particular um, dimension, and we shouldn't. So what do we do? If you were a subject, whether you were a student, faculty, administrator, I would ask, or my team would ask to speak for you for about an hour. We record the interviews, but afterwards you can say if you want to be identified or not, you want to be quoted or not, we don't care. We're not studying you with all due respect. We're studying how you think about things. Um, and it's what's called semi-structure. There are some questions which we ask of everybody, and there's some topics which we, meaning not questions, but supra-questions, like curriculum or campus life, which we touch on with everybody. But we don't ask exactly the same questions of a trustee that we would ask as a freshman. And if somebody answers three more questions the first time, we don't bore, we don't bore them um, by asking the later questions. Um, can anybody read these questions? How about you folks back there? Can you read it? Yes or no? Yes. Oh, good. Then I don't have to. <laughs> um, but keep your mind on the first question. If you could give one book to a graduating student before he or she leaves college, what might the book be? Because we're going to come back to that later. But you can see we have rank order questions. We have general questions like, is it important to go to college? Some people say college is transformative. Do you agree? So just to give you a sense, so those are just a half a dozen of the 40 questions. So we've done almost all the interviews. And this is social science talk. We begin with impressions, which is what I'm going to talk about today. That doesn't mean I'm going to imitate students. I mean, I'm going to tell you what I think is going on. Um, but we're in the midst of detailed coding, which is an amazingly time-consuming process, where we look at every interview and we categorize the answers to every question. And some of it is based on what we call big data, where we don't do the coding, the computer does the coding. And of course, that's interesting, because nobody else in the world is going to be crazy enough to do 2,000 interviews over seven years. But if the computer can do it, so much the better. Um, and so we're moving toward from impressions to findings, and then a year or two from now, we're going to have conclusions and recommendations. And frankly, most of the world will not care about how we analyze the data. Only the scholars will care about that. But the 17 or 18 funders are going to care a lot about the recommendations uh, and the conclusions. And you're getting kind of a sneak preview now, but nothing I say is written in stone, so please don't go tell the New York Times uh, this is what I found because it could change with the next data analysis. So this is a secret presentation. No, it's not that, but I'm not, anyway, you get the idea. Um, so yeah, early impressions and findings. So I'm gonna touch on six topics. 
You can all read them there. This is just a show I've organized, uh, and you can, you can check them off in your mind. So when I've gotten to Rays of Hope, you'll know I'm near the end, right? And by the way, I think that our concepts may well be the most important contributions that we make. Um, that is, if I had a guess from three or four years from now, if we're all alive and writing and getting attention, I think it's the concepts we come up with which grew out of our data. We didn't, ha we didn't have these concepts a priori. So, a mental model is how do people, whether they are freshmen or trustees, how do they think about college education? And we have four models. You can read the names, inertial, transactional, exploratory, and transformational. So, inertial means, essentially, I went to high school, the next step is college, that's why I'm here. It doesn't warm the cockles of my heart. But if you have kids, or you know kids in the neighborhood, or you teach, you suddenly know there are inertial kids around. Transactional. Secret. We get a lot of these types at Harvard. Transactional is, I want a degree, I'll do what it takes to get the degree, I'm not going to cheat and get kicked out or get too drunk and get kicked out, but don't stretch me. Don't ask me to do anything new. Just quid pro quo. Transactional. Exploratory. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity to go to an intellectual and social candy shop to study things I've never studied before, to meet people I've never met before, to go on a once-in-a-lifetime treasure hunt. So these are quotations here, um, and I'm not gonna read them, because um, I don't want you to quote what I said, no, because I figure even the people back there can read it, and if not, their seat's closer up. Um, transformational, that's a big deal. This is a student who says, you know, I use myself. I came from Scranton, Pennsylvania. I had a perfectly okay childhood, but the most valuable thing in Scranton was the one-way ticket out of there. You don't think that's funny? <laughs> um, but I want to be a different person, think of myself in a different way, and leave the candy store in a totally different way, intellectually, personally, socially, vocationally. Trans that's transformation. And you might say, well, how do we decide the category? And the answer is, um, we have a very detailed coding system, and we have to get agreement. That means the two coders have to agree whether the student is exploratory, transactional, transformational, or inertial. So here are some early findings. If you go to selective schools, you're more likely to have transformational mental models than transactional ones. That probably doesn't surprise you that much. But if you go to the more selective schools, I made a crack about Harvard, even though uh, we didn't study Harvard uh, in this particular study, the transactional responses increase where if you go to less selective schools, you have more people switching to be transformational. Also, and this was a distinction we never thought before we did the study, people who are on campus, students, faculty, administrators, talk about transformational much more than people who are off campus, parents, alums, and trustees. So again, these are preliminary findings but I hope it whets your appetite to say, well, you know, what happens to people when they go to a school? How do they start out? How do they end up? And why? Here's the second concept. In-house we call liberal arts and sciences capital, but I promise you that's not what we will call it when we go public. Um, you see, it's the current title. I'll tell you why I like this title. People who are from Project Zero know me. I love, I love puns, and liberal arts and sciences capital is abbreviated as LAS capital, which becomes LAS capital, which reminds me of Karl Marx's Das Kapital, <laughs> and of Thomas Piketty's book, Capital, but 
again, we're not going to go public with this, <laughs> but if you go to a non-vocational school, we argue that you want people to be able to express themselves in a liberal artsy kind of way. Now you might say, what the hell does that mean? Well, I'm going to make the assumption that all of you are kind of liberal artsy, or you wouldn't be spending a Friday afternoon here. And all of you have been on a train, or a bus, or a subway, or a plane. In fact, I was on two planes to get here. It took me 26 hours. Um, I don't wish that on anybody, except you know whom. Um, uh, um, you can talk to somebody for an hour, and you have some sense are they listening to the question? Are they interrogating it? Are they making connections? Are they saying, I don't quite understand what you mean? Or earlier I said this. So we analyze how much liberal arts and sciences capital people have. And we do it both by a holistic scoring, where we read the whole transcript and give a score of one, two, or three, three being the highest. And then we independently score seven specific questions. And the good news is there's a high resemblance be how, between how we score the seven individual questions and the holistic score, and it's not done by the same people. So anyway, the, the assumption is that we can tell how much liberal arts and sciences capital you have. We can't prove you don't have it, but we can prove you do have it if you, in the hour-long conversation, make the kinds of moves that I just mentioned. So here's what we found about LAS capital. The 10 schools differ a lot from one another in how much capital the incoming students have, the freshmen, and how much capital the students have when they leave. Very, very important. Some equally selective schools have quite different growth spurts. So what's a school like FIU? Um, let's make one up. Let's say uh, CIU, California International University. And let's say you have a similar student body. If in one student body, the average capital score is 1.8, no, for both schools, the average um, LAS capital score is 1.8 when you come in as a freshman. But in one of the two schools, the average is 2.8 after four years, and the other one is 1.7. Obviously, something's happening at the first school that's not happening at the second school. So we can see, over the four years, what kind of changes has happened. Though, we're not, it's not a longitudinal study except for one exception, which I can tell you about in the book signing. Um, the students who persevere at the less selective schools show the biggest leap. But of course, less selective schools have bigger dropout rates. And so this is not a completely um, fair comparison. Nonetheless, looking at the change of LAS capital or the change in mental models from inertial and transactional to transformational and exploratory gives you a sense of value added. And to be uh, a little bit daring, I think in the next 15, 20 years in this country, and probably in other countries too, higher education institutions are going to be judged by the value added. What's the difference between the incoming students and the leaving students? And I think um, concepts like this will be um, really relevant. So, this is a very revealing question. We ask people, what's the biggest problem on campus? And then we give them a rank order of five choices. Plagiarism or cheating, mental health, peer relations, alcohol, drug use, or safety. So I'm going to make you into a, a panel of a few hundred. You have, can only raise your hand once. How many of you think plagiarism and cheating is the biggest problem on campus? Okay, 7%. How many think mental health? Okay, 32%. How many think peer relations? 15%. I'm not adding this up, by the way. I'm just being <laughs> playing, playing a game with myself. Alcohol and drug use. Okay and safety. So here's the answer. Um, I was shocked when I began this study. But everywhere we go, in every constituency, particularly constituencies on campus, 
mental health is the biggest problem. We don't know why. We don't know if it would have been different 20 or 30 years ago. But it is a very big problem everywhere. And there's no way of sweeping it under the rug. This just, um, oh yeah, um, this just repeats what I just said. We're looking at how mental health issues are tackled across campuses, very interesting ways in which it's doing. But this is where big data can be very illuminating. I never did big data before. I mean, big data would just feed stuff to the computer and it tells us what it sees. We wanted to see the word help. And we were looking at the word help. We assumed it would be used by students to talk about when they're helping others. We were using it as a pro-social thing. But that's not how students use the word help. They use the word help when they're talking about needing help, which is a mental health and not a social thing. So uh, that, that was very illuminating for us. So this is something which only emerged in the last year in our study because it's a five-year data collection, and that's a term belongingness. I'd never heard about it before, but all of a sudden, as we say, it's gone viral on campus. And if you're involved with student life, whether you're doing uh, middle school or college, you'll be hearing about belongingness. Um, and again, this is where our study is very helpful. Um, many, many students now in America feel they don't belong. They feel alienated. They have a sense of ano me. They're not happy. But we figured out three different kinds of lack of belonging. One is when you don't identify with the institution. Um, I noticed that there's an athletic team here, and all the signs refer to the athletic team. That's one way to, I mean, at Ohio State, people do know about the football team, right? Uh, so institutional belonging is one kind. Academic belonging, feeling that you're involved with your courses, you're like your teachers, um, you want to study additionally. And peer belonging, which of course is very important. You feel that there are people that you can be friends with who like you, you don't feel isolated, alienated, and so on. And so, while belonging is the beginning of the conversation, discovering in what way students don't belong and what can be done to make them feel like they have a home. Uh, and by the way, for extra credit, I think this explains a lot of what's going on in the United States, which isn't working. And for those of you who follow the press on colleges, whether it's Me Too or Title IX or um, campus uh, policing of speakers, this all has to do with belonging and who feels they belong and who feels they don't belong. How many of you are involved with secondary schools? I'm sure it's not just a college issue, but it's something we're becoming much more aware of in the country as a whole. Okay, rank ordering. We give people choice. What's the purpose of college? So again, we'll give each of you one show, one vote. How many say, but this is, well, I guess, no, I don't want to know what you think. I want to know what you think our subjects think, okay? How many who think that our subjects will say that getting a job is the most important thing? Well, that's pretty popular. How many of you say getting different, different perspectives? Uh, how about becoming independent? How about studying content area in depth? All right, well, um, it's actually very interesting. It's not what you expected, but we can do unpacking of this. So when we ask this, the thing that gets the highest vote from people is gaining different perspectives, with getting a job as number two. But if you think getting different, gaining different perspectives may be a desirability response, namely, this is what people think they should say, uh, you might be right. But we're not that thick. So we ask people, what do you think other people will say? <laughs> and we also look at contradictions. So when somebody talks about getting a job from the beginning of the interview and then rates it number four as last, we know that they're being hypocritical. Um, nonetheless, the gaining of different perspectives increases from freshman to senior year in some places, and that's very significant. Okay, I'm gonna give you a little audience participation. Um, if you could give one book to a graduating 
senior, which book would you choose? Um, so why don't you just, I'll give you a minute or so uh, to talk with your neighbor about this. You could talk either about which one you would give or what you think other people would give. First of all, the most popular choice is Dr. Seuss. Uh, uh, and other popular choices are a book which I didn't, hadn't heard about in decades, Dale Carnegie's book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, or anything by Malcolm Gladwell, uh, or what the assigned reading is for the year, even if the student hasn't done it, uh, and their occasional classics. Um, about 30% of subjects can't name a single book. That's kind of disheartening. And we almost never get literary fiction or poetry, though we sometimes get um, the Bible or Shakespeare. Now, those of you who are in my line of work will know we could write a book just about this question. And we could write a book about many questions, but we're not going to write 40 books, so we have to decide which things are important. But I figured you're all literate, so you might enjoy dipping your toes into this question. So, any form of higher education now needs to deal with real threats. The fact that we have so much mental health, reported mental health difficulty, so much feeling of alienation, so much what we call vocationalism and hypervocationalism. And this often begins with the college um, uh, tour which we take, where all the tour guides talk about is what jobs you could get if you go there. And uh, that ranges from being a Wall Street mogul to uh, you know, inventing uh, the next app that's going to make you a zillionaire. Uh, not a lot of talking about the museum or the library. Um, and uh, because of the stuff I talked about in the beginning, that there's so much antipathy in this country, I hope it's not true elsewhere, to higher education or liberal arts. Uh, and so, if we want to help the higher education system here, we have to figure out how to deal with these challenges or threats. So I want to end on a somewhat more upbeat note. Um, we've created a survey which um, can be done completely online, and it seems to be similar enough to our interview that in the future people will not have to sit through 2,000 interviews. Uh, also, as I said, we're doing big data analysis, which means that in the future, if we're lucky, we don't have to do human coding. A lot of it can be done by a machine. And as I said in the beginning, um, we think that the concepts we've developed um, may well be useful to um, people, even if they don't particularly know or care about our study. If we're trying to look at things which we think may be helpful in the future. I think we have to think about how to address the mental health challenges, the belonging challenges. I think preparation for college needs to start probably with the college tours and interviews, even before kids get in. And it really needs to start the day after you admit it. And you have to have contact with families, with students, with secondary school teachers, as well as students. Because to put it be blunt, many, many freshmen are totally lost for the first year. That's not good. Which means the, lowest, the first year should be inviting and positive and not a way of um, dropping students who don't get it. Um, I'm going to skip this. Um, because what I want to do is to talk about my favorites, and it says stay tuned. Um, I have lots of ideas about how to make things better, um, but I'd like to use my remaining 18 minutes and 46 seconds to talk about what I thought I was going to talk about, which is international perspectives, OK? This so is for those uh, of you who uh, are not only um, domestically uh, educated as I was. So first of all, as you know, lots of schools now have campuses abroad. I don't know, does FIU have a campus abroad, or it does? Bill Anderson says yes. Um, Bard College has a 
liberal arts school in Berlin. Actually, this, this will interest you. Liberal arts is really a growth industry in Eastern Europe and in China and in India. Being naughty, I ask myself, is a growth industry there because people know what it is or because they don't know what it is? Uh, but I think they meet people from Amherst or from Pomona, and they say, these people are kind of well-educated, and we want people in Singapore or in Poland to be well-educated too. But it, it's a growth industry elsewhere. And in, East, and in Europe, there's a higher education enterprise called the Bologna Process, in which um, the universities in Europe are trying to be more on the same page. And I've become involved with a very important project in um, Europe called the Plato Project, which is trying to um, think about what's the higher education that's needed in the 21st century. Um, that's the name of the, Olga is the person who leads the, who leads the Plato Project, but it's a 30 or 40 million euro enterprise in Europe trying to think through what is positive learning, the kind of learning we want to have in the cyber age. And the, what I'm going to say for the next 16 minutes is what I have written for the Plato Project, and it's actually available online, but I'm going to try to give you my view of what I think higher education needs to focus on internationally in the 21st century. Um, I love alliteration, and so I think higher education needs to pay attention to context, character, and curriculum. And I want to focus more on curriculum because this is a thinking skills conference. But context is obviously very important. What does the school say it stands for? Anybody know what school this is? Yale. We don't like Yale, but Yale. <laughs> Light and truth. And it's great to have a, a, a Latin phrase or a mission statement, but of course those are worthless unless the school really tries to develop a context in which people take um, those missions seriously. It's very hard to do, but I can tell you this, having now worked intensively at 10 schools and having visited probably 50 over the last seven years, if students know what the school is about, they take it seriously, they try to realize it, and when the school is not living up to what it claims, uh, they make noise. That's very important. In too many schools in our, this I mean higher education institutions, where not just students, but faculty and parents are clueless about what it's all about, what the context is, what the mission is, I can guarantee you it's a very difficult situation. So the second C is character. This is something my colleagues and I at Project Zero have studied for well over 20 years as part of the Good Work Enterprise. How many of you have heard about the Good Work Enterprise? Great, we got a free candy bar on the way out. Um, we've been trying to understand what it means to be a good person, a good worker, a good citizen. It's an empirical study. We're still working on it. And if you go to the Good Project website, you can find out what it is that we're doing. But the Good Work is really about character. It's the kind of human beings that we admire and want to emulate. And when we talk about what good work is, it's work that's excellent in tech and quality. Let's take teaching. You know, we want the teacher to know what he or she is teaching. The teacher cares about it. It's very hard to be a good teacher if you don't care, if it's not engaging, if it's not meaningful. And it's carried out ethically. All of us in education are dealing with, edu with ethical issues every day, whether we're aware of it consciously or not better be aware of it than not. Nobody is ethical all the time, but it's a question of trying to be ethical, of reflecting with other people, not thinking you always know the answer. And when you screw up, admitting it and trying to do it better, those are the symptoms of good work. And we have a nice um, visual. We call it the triple helix um, for excellence and ethics and engagement. And you all know about DNA. Well, this is ENA begins because all three of those words begin with E, excellence, ethical, and engagement. And you don't get to be a good worker, a person of good character, unless you can 
um, exemplify all three strands of E. So we're talking about higher education now. What's the mission of the school? To what extent do people know it? How important is character? And the best way of learning about character, by the way, is the same as the best way of learning about mission. And that's to have people there, older people, older students, and staff, and administrators, and faculty who walk the talk. Every one of you knows this, but how few institutions actually have people walking the talk every day in how they behave. And that's probably the most important gift we can give to students. Not blah, 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 but how do we behave in different both situations. So curriculum. This is what I was going to talk about for an hour, but I decided that 10 minutes, 12 minutes was enough. Uh, so I think, and here I'm really sticking my neck out, but why not? I've reached the age where if you don't stick your neck out now, you're probably going to be too late, right? No chuckles? Anyway, I think that when you get to higher education, there are two courses everybody should take in the two capacities which everybody should develop. But I'm going to focus on the courses because you can't do the capacities unless you have the courses. And the courses are called philosophy and semiotics. Now, I probably lost most of you, but we're not going to use those words, just like we're not going to use the word liberal arts, because we don't want to have antipathy without any reason. So, what's philosophy? Philosophy is simply asking the biggest questions that human beings ask. Who am I? Where am I headed? What's the world? Why are people good? Why are people bad? Why do we fight? Why do we love? Every human being who isn't completely brain damaged asks these questions. But most human beings don't realize these are questions that have been thought out by wise people over hundreds, if not thousands of years. And philosophy is a way of inviting young people into that conversation. So you begin with what you think about those issues, which is valid, but then you find out about how people who are thoughtful have thought about this in language, but it can be in other art forms, in other media as well. And it's not the sort of thing that most young people, before they're in, before they're at a certain age, before they're well into adolescence, can really apprehend. So it's fine if, you, if you're doing philosophy in a new key at fifth grade, or if you're in an elite school where they're reading Plato uh, in 10th grade, but it's not the norm. The ability to, to go beyond your own way of thinking and realize whether the person's name is Plato, or Hannah Arendt, or in this case, my own teacher, Suzanne Langer, that they had very thoughtful things to say about these issues, that's really the gift we can give people when they are ready for higher education. So semiotic sounds even worse, and I would never use that term, but it's something which all of us come to understand, but most of us don't understand until we are at a certain level of cognitive maturity. And that is, we communicate in all sorts of ways. I mean, I'm communicating to you now in words, but I also have a tone of voice. I'm trying to interact with you. Um, if I think people are wandering, I might speak more quietly. Or if I think that time is up, I may speak more quickly. Um, many people would make presentations with music. Um, these are things which, again, it's not that younger people are completely unaware of it, but the different codes that we use, which semiotics uh, just means sign or symbol, the different codes we use um, are extremely important <coughs> in life. And of course, nowadays, so much of the communication occurs through digital codes, through different kinds of computer languages, through different kinds of apps, and being aware of all the different ways in which we gain and convey information um, is really something that's crucial. If you, just want to, if you don't want to be fooled all the time, but we can't really be um, metacognitive about this until most of us are in late adolescence. Um, the most famous semiotician is Charles Sanders Peirce, 
who by general agreement was the greatest American philosopher, but because um, he's very opaque, most people don't know him, and so John Dewey, who's fine, takes his place. Um, I was very happy to see in The Economist that they actually used the word semiotics the other day. Um, no, we don't want that. Um, they had a study about, it's a perfectly semiotic study. Uh, it's a very interesting study. They wanted to see what can get people to be moderate about an issue. And so they used the same word, but they either expressed it as a noun or as a verb. So um, if they used the word division rather than the word dividing, even though the point was exactly the same, people were much less likely to get upset. And so this finding was that verbs are much more likely to activate people and to make them pugnacious, where exactly the same word when given as a nominal form makes people more relaxed. I think that's an amazing finding, but it's completely a semiotic finding. It shows you how a tiny change in word can actually get people's attitudes to change significantly. And again, you know, there are going to be some 12-year-olds who can appreciate that, and there are going to be some 50-year-olds who are clueless, but basically it's the kind of thing that you can begin to understand in later adolescence. Now, in that article for the Plato Project, I talk about two other kinds of thinking, which will be familiar to you, particularly if you've been infected by Project Zero, namely interdisciplinary thinking and synthesizing. Interdisciplinary thinking is being able to combine different disciplines. Synthesizing is taking a lot of information and trying to put it together in a way that makes sense. And some of you know I've written a lot about the synthesizing mind. The reason I didn't want to mention it here is because unless you've got some stuff, some disciplines, and some understanding of, of science systems, you can't really synthesize or do interdisciplinary work very well. And so, and I, I know I'm a minority here, I'm saying let's get the disciplines first before we mix disciplinary uh, ways of thinking, and let's get some more ways of thinking before we synthesize them. So, if you want to know basically what Gardner is saying in the talk that was going to be an hour, but I've cut it down to 10 minutes, in higher education, every student should be exposed to philosophical way of thinking, the big issues and how people have thought about it. And that should begin as a freshman, but it should be revisited as a senior. And every student should be exposed to the fact that we're communicating all the time with all different kinds of symbol systems and very little changes of tone of voice, of, of visual presentation, of um, other art forms, and even going from a nominal form to a verb form can really affect the way people think. And then for the rest of the time, when you've gotten those ideas, then you can do more interdisciplinary and more synthesizing sorts of things. So, summary slide. We can all heave a sigh of relief. So we began with saying, look, Gardner's known for K-12 work, but uh, he got very upset with what he was learning about um, what college kids prioritize and how the rest of the world was thinking about higher education, liberal arts. So with a bunch of colleagues, whose names I will tell you in the next slide, um, we undertook this big national study where the data collection is almost over. Um, we asked so far over 1,900 people from eight different constituencies at all different kinds of higher education institutions, approximately 40 questions. We read them holistically. We, we code, we're coding each of them. We're doing it by human nature, but also by computer. We have a survey. And what I did for you today, because you all took a promise not to tell the media, was to talk about the concepts that we now have, like mental models and liberal arts and sciences, capital and belongingness, um, and what we think uh, that means. What are the challenges and what are the raised hope? What are the sorts of things we might do to deal with some of these challenges? Then um, I said these are not just American issues. While liberal arts is on the wane in this country, at least so described, it's not in other parts of the world. Um, I could spend all my time just corresponding with people in Europe and Asia, South Asia and Southeast Asia, uh, and uh, Japan and Korea who think they're doing liberal arts and trying to do it better. Um, 
And yet, um, there is not consensus by any means about what should be done. That's why the Plato project is very important because it's bringing together dozens of researchers. They're actually meeting next week in um, Germany. I can't go there, but I'm going to attend some of it by um, Zoom, whatever that is. How many people know what Zoom is? Look at that. Right? You're way ahead of me. Now, here's the real thing. How many of you remember the PBS show Zoom? Look at that, you got a zoom, 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 ah, zoom. All right, that means, you're, that means you're at least uh, half my age. Uh, um, so for me, in thinking about higher education, and that's what I'm gonna spend the rest of my life thinking about, there's the issue of what's the context, what's the mission, what are you trying to achieve, and to what extent is it in the DNA of the institution, so everybody knows it and tries to aspire to it. Number two, what's the kind of human beings you wanna have? We want to model and we want to push children, students, and faculty in that direction. And finally, um, if we're not going to be completely vocational, remember that what the kid at Olin said, the best of both worlds, an engineering degree and a liberal arts education, we want them to be exposed to philosophical thinking, to semiotic awareness, and then to be able to do interdisciplinary and synthesizing thinking because that's the stuff which uh, is least likely to be algorithmic and done completely by machines uh, in the future. And these are all the people who work with me. Dick Light, some of you will know, is a senior project advisor, a longtime colleague. Wendy Fishman, who some of you will know from Project Zero, is a senior project member, manager. And the people who are doing the bulk of the interviews and who are coding uh, and who are doing st uh, statistical analysis are listed here. And if you want to know more, I have a blog. Uh, the blog can be reached at howardgardner.com. And the blog is called Lifelong Learning. There have been about 20 blogs already. And to be honest, they're just, I write about what I'm interested in. But over the next year, it's going to evolve, it's going to transmogrify into an early presentation of our findings. Um, so if this interests you and you want to know more, you don't want to wait three decades for the books to come out, you can go to the website and read about it there. So I have 36 seconds left, uh, and I think I'll say class dismissed, thank you.